morning, everybody. Um, it's a nice, wholesome story to start a Sunday morning. Hey, <laughs> it's a pretty intense passage we'll look at today. Um, yeah, we're just going to have the, the sermon now, and then we're going to respond with communion afterwards today. Um, and we're starting another series this year, a fresh series through Matthew, we're sort of just tracking through Matthew's gospel over a few years. And um, this um, year, we're going to look through verse, uh, chapters 14 to 20. Uh, which is kind of the next section or block of teaching in Matthew's Gospel. And um, this year it's called The Servant. Um, last year was The Man, and we're looking at lots of different responses to the man Jesus. And the, this section is still a lot about different responses to Jesus, and even today is Herod's response to Jesus. Um, but increasingly we see that Jesus and who he is doesn't match what they thought of the Messiah and King would be, but because he's actually come as a servant, and not to be served, but to serve and ultimately to give his life, and, and Jesus is the servant king. Um, so we're going to kind of look through this over this year, just in different blocks like we've been doing, and, and, and then look at some other topical teaching throughout the year as well. Um, and it's interesting, we've just been talking about John the Baptist throughout Christmas and uh, the Christmas Advent um, sort of theme and story references John the Baptist's birth and, and Zechariah and Elizabeth and his miraculous birth, and, and now we're going to look at his death. And Interesting as well that last year when we started off the last section in Matthew, started with John the Baptist in prison, having some doubts and coming to Jesus with his doubts. And now this section towards the beginning of it is John the Baptist still in prison, but we sort of start to hear some of the story of how he actually was killed. Um, I just have one brother, um, and I'm the oldest, so I don't really know what it's like to have older siblings, um, but Tam is the youngest. Uh, so I've kind of experienced a little bit what it's like to have older siblings through being married to her, and it's great because you just get all this free stuff. So like so much stuff we have is is handed down from her older brothers and sisters. They had kids before us. They got married before us, and it's a cool experience because I hadn't really experienced yeah having people to look up to that had sort of been ahead of you in in life, um, but she has, and and I've kind of experienced it through being married to her and, and being a part of her family, which is really cool. And and Jesus is is a firstborn, so he was the oldest in his family, but John was born just a little bit before Jesus and, and related to him, and John's ministry was before Jesus, and, and teaching was before Jesus, and, and John's whole sort of calling has been to go ahead of Jesus, and, and we see that that's sort of what's happening in, in John's ministry. His, his miraculous birth is just before Jesus, his, his teaching ministry is before, and then we even see in this story that his death is before, and in some ways, Jesus is, is looking at John. Now, obviously, Jesus is the leader and, and is greater than John, but, but John is on this journey that Jesus is coming after and is a very similar journey, as we'll see. So um, we're going to go through this, this passage, which is a bit of a strange passage because it's not um, focused on Jesus. It's, it's really focused on John and Herod, but also their response to Jesus. So we're going to go through and, um, yeah, contrast Herod and John in this pretty tragic story. So, as we just read from chapter 14, verse 1 to 2, says, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the reports about Jesus. He said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That is my miraculous powers are at work in him. So, we've been going through Matthew's gospel, and he's had lots of different responses to Jesus. The passage just before this that we looked at at the end of last year was um, even Jesus' hometown response to him in Nazareth, and they kind of just saw him as the kid from down the street, and why is he so important, and they were offended at him. And now we see Herod's response. Um, Herod um, is a ruler in Galilee, Herod Antipas. His father was Herod the Great, who was the one who tried to kill Jesus at his birth. Now, this, this Herod is a uh, ruler of a smaller area um, that was divided up after his father's death. But it's interesting, just like Herod the Great saw Jesus' birth as a threat, um, this Herod Antipas as well, in, in many ways, his response to Jesus is one of fear. Um, he's afraid when he starts to hear about Jesus and his ministry. And his fear is related to what he had done to John, his fear and his guilt um, because of how he had killed John. And so Herod, as we'll see, even though he's a powerful man, even though he's probably a rich man, even though he probably lives in quite a lot of comfort and luxury, as we go through the story, we can see his life is dominated by fear. And his initial response to Jesus is even one of fear. And because he's afraid of Jesus, he is closed to Jesus. Because of how he treated John, it's almost paranoid. 
and, and thinks this crazy superstition that this is somehow John the Baptist raised from the dead. But it's interesting because in the gospel, other people, when people are wondering who Jesus is, they sort of say, hey, maybe this is John the Baptist, which, again, says something amazing about John the Baptist, that, that he pointed people to Jesus so well, and he, he, he represented Jesus so well that then Jesus think, people think Jesus is John. So it's like, like his ministry was so amazing in that sense and just how much authority John had and, and spiritual um, influence. But we see that Herod was afraid of Jesus, which led him to being close to him. Instead of being open to Jesus, as soon as he hears about him, oh, this must be John, and, and it's this guilt and this fear and this closed nature. But John, in his ministry and his life, rightly feared and honored Jesus, which led him to trust him. Uh, one's afraid, which is this paranoid domination of fear that leads to being closed, and one is this godly fear of reverence and awe and, and wonder that when John sees Jesus, he recognizes the greatness of who he is, and he's not even worthy to be in his presence. Um, Herod um, assumes out of his, his guilt and his fear that Jesus is against him and is a threat to him. Uh, John, when he sees Jesus, welcomes him and trusts him and honors him. And even when John has doubts in prison, as we saw in Matthew 11, he even brings his doubts to Jesus and is still open to Jesus in that place. So what we're going to do as we go through is kind of contrast these two characters, Herod and John, and then sort of think, well, how do we see ourselves in each of these as well? Um, perhaps at times we may be like Herod or respond to God as Herod does out of fear. Not a godly fear, but being afraid. Um, if we're afraid of God, we're afraid of Jesus, maybe we perceive them as a threat to us. And when we see threats, we often close, not willing to trust and maybe even avoid Maybe some people see Jesus as being scary or someone who's against us or will condemn us. It's interesting that again and again, God's message to people is don't be afraid. <laughs> he appears to people and says, don't be afraid. Fear is that, that sort of being afraid and, and cowering and, and seeing God as a threat is not the right response. It shuts us down to Him. But again, in the Bible, being, having a fear of God is important. Um, this is a, a fear of God that recognizes who He is and honors him and respects him and ultimately comes to trust him. The quote on this by Tristan and Jonathan Collins, they said, this act of clinging to God is the, is the essence of what it means to fear God. Fearing God means finding comfort and protection in your relationship to the divine. It means growing in your trust. It means deferring to God's definition of what is good and bad. It means trusting God's wisdom over our own. So ultimately, if you fear God, it's a, it's a respect and an honor that leads us to actually be open to Him and actually to trust Him and actually to submit to Him and not take things and, and sort of seek to serve ourselves and, and do things in our own strength. Herod feared Jesus and saw Him as a threat. John feared God and submitted and trusted to His authority. The story then keeps on going and, and sort of starts to get into some of the backstory of, of how John died. And it's pretty... Um, yeah, messed up. <laughs> so it says this, Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. So Herod was married. Um, he had another marriage. And then he fell in love with his sister-in-law, Herodias. So he divorced his first wife, to be able to be with her, and she obviously left her husband to be with him. And John effectively just starts calling this out as wrong. Um, obviously wrong to divorce his wife, but then also to do it to be able to go and be with your brother's wife. Um, it's, a, it's wrong in uh, Leviticus 18.16, talks about not having relationships with your brother's wife. And, and John's effectively just going around and saying the truth. The truth is what Herod's doing is not lawful. It, it doesn't fit with God's law. And Herod is supposed to be a, a ruler in Israel. He's supposed to be someone anointed by God and, and representing God to the people. And in some ways, John's rebuke is probably a, a somewhat sub, subversive kind of implied attack on Herod's legitimacy as king. Because John's role is to be the forerunner of the true king and the true Messiah. So pointing out the fact that, well, the current ruler is actually not doing what's lawful, shows that he's actually illegitimate. Yet this um, is therefore a threat to Herod, 
and his power and his position and where he finds himself. So Herod's response is to suppress the truth. The truth is what he's doing is wrong, according to Scripture. But Herod wants to do it, so he needs to suppress the truth. So Herod indulged his selfish desires and then sought to suppress the truth. Whereas John lived a life of self-denial and spoke the truth, even at cost to himself. Obviously, Herod, in some ways, is captive to his own desires. He's made commitments to, to one woman, but then falls in love with someone else and just leaves her and goes with this one. And, and then when confronted with it, he um, doesn't say, well, actually, that's true. What I'm doing is wrong. He puts the messenger in prison. So he, he doesn't want to listen to the scriptures. When people point it out, he wants to lock them up. And then ultimately, his, his wife Herodias wants to kill um, John to silence him once and for all and to completely suppress the truth. But Herod's even afraid of the people. Um, in Mark, it seems like Herod's also afraid of John. So there's just a lot of fear that's present there. Yet um, John, in many ways, lives the opposite kind of life. He, he's lived a life of self-denial, of dedication to God from his birth, of fasting, of living in the wilderness, of being, like we've talked about before, being holy and literally he's actually separate from society to, to call people to renewal and repentance. And he's lived this totally different life and he's willing to speak truth and actually confront someone in power who has the power to bind him and kill him. He's willing to do that even at great cost to himself. Because Herod fears man, Herod wants his desires met, seeks comfort in, in, in using and fulfilling his human desires, whereas John fears God, lives a life of self-denial, faithfulness to God, and even willing to lay down his life. So again, as we go through, we can sort of probably see aspects of Herod maybe in ourselves, in our story, um, and can see how we're called to be like John and how he's like Jesus as well. Um, Herod is carried away by selfish desires that leads to suppress the truth. Um, maybe we're tempted at times to sort of fall into the lie of like, oh, I'm doing this thing that's not flying up. Might be the battery. Um, we're okay now? So we might be tempted to, I'll just keep going and if um, it plays up, we'll swap over. So, cool. We might be tempted to, to play into the lie that, well, there's actually no real truth, like, you can just do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Uh, as long as you feel good about it and feel right about it, then it's okay. And, and maybe um, people might point out things to us that are, that are wrong. Or maybe that, that Scripture teaches this is, this is wrong or it shouldn't be done. And maybe there's a temptation to say, oh, the Bible doesn't really say that. Or it's, it's not really clear or, or kind of suppress the truth or, or kind of minimize the truth of God's Word. Um, now, there's a need to interpret Scripture rightly and and there's a need for the Spirit to guide us in that, and there's a need to understand background and context and, and all of that. But at the same time, sometimes um, it's possible to come to the Bible with a desire and seek to manipulate the truth so that we can satisfy a desire. That's, a, I guess, a sinful way that we try to suppress the truth. And so there's a challenge not to be like Herod in that. Because the, the truth is, the Bible teaches that there is a way that's right. Uh, which is a controversial thing in our society, right? Like there's, there is a true way to live. There is right and wrong that's defined by God and actually we're called to follow. Um, so the question in many ways is what's more important, our desires, our comfort or the truth? And are we willing to trust God and his definition of good and bad? Also, like John, um, there's a call perhaps for us to be people who are willing to speak truth and represent truth, and share God's Word and Scripture, even when it's unpopular, and even when it may cost. Um, obviously, that can be done poorly. <laughs> that doesn't mean just going around and confronting everyone. It doesn't mean having a cost because we're being inappropriate or offensive by our behavior, but to humbly stand on God's Word and speak truth, even though sometimes it may cost. And I feel challenged, and I suppose it's a challenge to... to Realize that Jesus lived like that, John lived like that, a willingness to say, hey, actually, this is what Scripture says, even if it's going to get them in trouble. Um, other people throughout history have done that. Martin Luther is a famous one in his, um, what he wrote during the Reformation and then his willingness to stand on it 
um, with his life is the famous quote of what he said. He said, unless I am convinced by Scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. It's the story of a man convinced by the Word of God who's willing to stand up to power and to stand on it, even though it costs him. Um, it's an amazing example that actually following the truth, speaking the truth, may not be comfortable, may come at great cost, but is the way that many have gone ahead of us. And that's really how John ended up in prison. And, and that's all he did in the, in the story. All, all he said is, hey, what you're doing is not lawful. <laughs> like, not, what you're doing doesn't match what God says to do. And it got him in prison. And then we go on and we see how this story of him being in prison actually led to his death. In the next verse, on Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me here the, on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Again, this is pretty messed up. This is Herod's niece, his brother's daughter, who's now, I guess, his stepdaughter, probably dancing quite suggestively, and he's probably drunk, and he makes an oath, and then when the oath, when Herodias takes the opportunity to use this to, um, as an opportunity to kill John, um, it says in the next verse, um, the king was distressed, but because of the oath and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. It's such a tragic story. This is like a great prophet of God in jail. Herod doesn't even really want to kill him, but is so fearful and, and flippant that he's drunk and, and he's made this oath and all these people are watching and he's kind of like, oh, okay, go ahead. Like, and then John dies. It's like that's the end of his, his life. Um, in, in some ways, Herod basically breaks almost every one of Jesus' commands in the Sermon on the Mount in this passage, right? Like, like he's making this oath, he's full of lust, he's drunk, he's hating, he's killing. It's just this destructive, gruesome, tragic end to John's life. So we see in Herod that Herod's fear of man and unrestrained desire ultimately leads to the death of a prophet of God. Whereas John, John's faithfulness to God and willingness to speak the truth to power ends up leading to his own death. Jesus had called John the greatest man born of woman, and now Herod has killed him as a result of his fear and his unrestrained desires. I think there's something for us in this, and, and again, something challenging for me in this, that, that fear and being dominated by fear, it, it's not a neutral thing. It is actually a sin. Uh, there, there's, there's nuance that's needed here, because right, fear is an emotion that, that, that we need to survive. If you're in the middle of a road and a car comes screaming towards you, you have a fear response and jump out of the road. That's an appropriate response. That, that's helpful, but being dominated by fear or controlled by fear or not in those sort of moments, but throughout life being afraid of people or, or things and dominated by it is, is sin and actually leads to other sin is actually destructive. And we see in this story that Herod's afraid of people, he's afraid to restrain himself, he's afraid of his wife and ultimately ends to the death of John. Um, on this, Francis Robert, um, Robert says, Be not faint of heart. Fear will rob you of your possession as quickly as any other sin, for truly fear is a sin, and it opens the door for many other sins to follow. Again, the nuance is just, just to feel sin, to feel fear is an emotion. You can't necessarily control that, but to give in to it, to be dominated by it, to be controlled by it, leads to other sin as well. We see this with Herod, and it leads to this tragic death of John. And it's a, a warning of the end result of, of giving into fear, giving into drunkenness, of giving into oaths, of lust in his story, it leads to this tragic end. And if we look at the story, though, like, you could probably think, like, when I read this, I'm like, what? Like, how is it that this is how John dies? Like, 
it's such a sad way to die. It seems like such a, just a random, flippant thing that Herod's in, a, in this way, there's this moment of opportunity of his wife, and then now John is beheaded, and it's such a tragic thing. And even earlier, we sort of said John seemed to have some doubts about, like, well, why is he in prison if Jesus has come? And now we could say the same thing. Well, why is John beheaded if, if Jesus has come? If, if Jesus' kingdom is coming, why is this prophet of God killed in such a terrible way like the plaything of a, of a human king? Like, where is God <laughs> when we read this story? But the interesting thing is that th- though John died in this way, he still fulfilled his call. He still actually um, made straight the path for Jesus. He pointed people to Jesus through even his birth, then through his ministry, through his teaching, and then even through his death, he actually points to Jesus. Because John's death is tragic, gruesome, humiliating, and it makes it look like God is not present and that evil human rulers get the last word. That's what this story looks like in many ways. It's, it's a gruesome story. It's a tragic story. It's a humiliating death for John. But the truth is, John is not only a forerunner to Jesus in his life and in his ministry, but also in his death. Because Jesus' death will be tragic, gruesome, humiliating, and make it look like God is not present and that evil human rulers get the last word. In Matthew's Gospel, in, in many ways, um, John's death is the shadow that shows what's coming ahead for Jesus. John has gone ahead of Jesus in life, in birth. Now he goes ahead in death. And this is actually the same path that Jesus is on, of confronting the power, confronting the evil in the world that will ultimately lead to his death. Because Jesus is a king, but his kingdom is not like this world. His kingdom is different. We see human rulers like Herod in the kingdom of this world rule with fear, suppress the truth, indulge selfish and unrestrained desires which lead to the death and suffering of the innocent. We see that in Herod's life, in in the Roman um, authorities that were present at the time in Jesus' uh, ministry. We can kind of think like, well, that was back then, but that's today still. Like, that's today in, in many places in the world. It's today where people have power and money and dominate and oppress and use fear to control, and it leads to suffering of people who are weak and broken and poor. And, and that's how humans kind of work in many ways, sinful humans. But Jesus' kingdom is not like that. Jesus is the servant king who is faithful to God, reveals the truth, and lays down his life for his enemies. He doesn't rule with fear and death, but with the power of self-giving resurrection love. Jesus is ruling and bringing his kingdom even through his death. And he doesn't um, rule by the threat of death. He offers his life for his enemies and calls people to follow him. So we're called to follow Jesus, not Herod. We're called to seek to serve, not be served. We're called to give life rather than take it. And John's whole life pointed to Jesus, including his death. And we are called as well to follow Jesus and be people who our lives point to Jesus and invited that even the way that we die could point to Jesus as well. In many ways, the the challenge and the the tension, I think, represented in Herod and John is the, the tension of what it means to live apart from God and what it leads to live the way of the kingdom, which is the kingdom of the world says, hold on to our life at all costs, but then we end up losing it. Herod's holding on to his life, protecting his power, satisfying his desires, but ultimately leads to death and ultimately will lead to his own death as well. Whereas Jesus and John lay down their life, count the cost, but in so doing actually find it, actually give life and um, have resurrection power and and God's kingdom come through that. Um, So in many ways, these are uh, the response that we have. uh, Are we living like Herod? operating out of fear of man, leading to holding on, leading to death, or trust and fear of God, willingness to even speak truth at cost to ourselves in love, 
but actually finding our life in Jesus. Um, so what we're going to do today as, as we respond is, is share communion. Um, and we are, yeah, just starting this series um, through Matthew's Gospel from chapter 14. There's still a long way to go um, till Jesus' crucifixion. And sort of we're early in the year. We just had Christmas, so, but soon we'll be looking towards Easter. And we see that Jesus' life, um, the sort of shadow that's over it, that's coming ahead, even as John has died, that Jesus will go this way as well. Um, but in it, he will have the victory. So I'm just going to pray and then yeah, invite you to take uh, your communion as a response. And then we're going to uh, sing um, as well. So Lord, we just thank you um, yeah, for John's life and his witness to Jesus. And we thank you for Jesus' ministry and willingness to speak truth, um, to trust you, um, to lay down life and count the cost. And yeah, you call us to, to follow you as well. And we just ask, God, that you would free us from fear, um, free us to fear you alone, to trust you alone, free us to live lives of truth and love and willingness to lay down our lives and count the cost, Lord. We just pray for those who that is a true reality for all around the world right now, that you give them boldness and courage and pray for us in our circumstances and, and lives as well. Give us boldness and wisdom and courage to stand in love and truth for you, Lord. Just thank you, Jesus, for your life that you gave, uh, for how your kingdom comes through your death, not through the power of death, but through the power of life that comes through resurrection. And we just thank you that you've defeated death and called us to follow you. Just ask you to bless us as we remember you now in your name. Amen.